This is Macro Voices, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 417 was produced on February 29th, 2024. I'm Eric Townsend. Bianco Research founder Jim Bianco returns as this week's feature interview guest. And the topic de jour is inflation, Fed policy, and why Jim thinks the Fed has to start cutting in May or June, or else not cut at all before the November election. We'll also discuss what's holding up the stock market, precious metals, and more. I also have a new Substack post this week titled The Nuclear Henry Ford Moment, which lays out my vision for how to make nuclear energy even cheaper than energy from coal and gas. You can find that at erictownsend.substack.com, and there's a link in your Research Roundup email. And I'm Patrick Ceresna with the Macro Scoreboard week over week as of the close of Wednesday, February 28, 2024. The S&P 500 futures up 170 basis points, trading at 5,081. NVIDIA-driven breakout consolidating into the PCE price index numbers. We'll take a closer look at that chart and the key technical levels to watch in the post-game segment. The U.S. dollar index down 8 basis points to 103.91. The April WTI crude oil contract up 81 basis points, trading at 78.54, edging toward those January highs, but will it break out? We will take a closer look at that chart in the post game, and Eric will have the EIA inventory data. The April Arbob gasoline up 79 basis points, trading at 255. The April gold contract up 39 basis points to 2042. The 2000 level support offered a bounce, but will the bulls be able to build on it? Copper down 103 basis points, trading at 384. Uranium down 484 basis points to 94.45. Now a multi-week correction asking the question if we will see the buy on dip trader step in. The U.S. 10-year treasury yield down six basis points trading at 426. And the key news to watch is Friday's ISM manufacturing PMI. And next week we have the Bank of Canada and the ECB monetary policy statements, Powell testimony before the Senate Banking Committee, and the monthly jobs numbers. This week's feature interview guest is Bianco Research founder Jim Bianco. Eric, why did we invite Jim back as a guest this week? Well, we originally had Jim scheduled for our March 14th podcast, but Jim's tweet thread from two weeks ago really caught my attention, and I felt it was important to get an expanded version of his inflation call to our listeners before the March 12th CPI data is released. So we reshuffled our schedule in order to put him on early this week. I think you're really going to enjoy this one, folks. And if Jim's right, I think markets are going to be in for a surprise. Well, Eric's interview with Jim Bianco is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's your host, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Bianco Research founder, Jim Bianco. Jim, great to have you back on the show. I'm really anxious to talk to you about a tweet thread that you posted a couple of weeks ago that really caught my attention because so many people have convinced themselves, look, the, the fix is in. The Fed's already told us they're going to have a rate cutting cycle this year. It's an election year. You, you, you know that markets are, are totally going to be supported by Fed policy because inflation is under control. And besides that whole debate about inflation's behind us now. Everybody knows it's going back to 2%. You don't think so. Tell us why not. Yeah. Um, I think that what we need to understand about what's happening is, and this is an old saw for people that have heard me before, 2020 was a big deal. It really changed a lot of attitudes. And coming out of those attitudes, uh, coming out of that lockdown restart of the economy, you know, the economy is a different beast right now. It is not the 2019 economy. I would argue that what we saw in the last three years was we had two things happen at the same time. We did have an element of transitory inflation 
which came about because of the supply chain restart, lockdown first and then restart, got us to 9%. That dissipated. We kind of worked our way down into the low threes. I'm talking year over year CPI, just to keep one measure. And Wall Street then invented a term called the last mile around the middle of last year to talk about the move from three to two on inflation and the Fed could then start cutting. One of the things I've been arguing is, first of all, Wall Street's very good at now casting. And for those who are not familiar with the term, now casting means forecasting something that just happened and say it's about to happen, where a forecast is predict something that hasn't happened that will happen. And now cast is we got to 3% inflation in June of 2023, year over year CPI. That's the low. The low in the cycle was seven months ago. Uh, I think we're going to hold that low through the February number, possibly through the March number, and maybe even until the fall. And yeah, I understand we're at 3.1. And this whole last mile argument, so we go from three to two, no, we invented the, the term right as we hit the low. Now, why do I think we hit the low? I think there's three big things. One is, let's call it the base effect. If you look at the, and the numbers from a year ago, You've got a four tenths that you had in February of 23, but you've had a big run up in gasoline prices in February of 24. So things like the Cleveland Fed and others that forecast CPI are saying that we should have another four tenths number. Okay, that means we'll have another 3.1. Well, then after that, you look at March, April, May, June, July, there's a lot of 0.1s and a lot of 0.2s from a year ago. So we're going to be dropping some very, very low numbers. And even if we print points ones and point twos, we're still stuck at three. If we print point twos and point threes, we start drifting higher. Gasoline prices are definitely working against us. The base effect's working against us. And the other big one I've been pushing back against is everybody looks at owner's equivalent rent and they say that's about a third of, or shelter-ish is about a third of of CPI and that that's got to fall because all the real-time measures like apartments.com, Zillow, you know, maybe even Case Stiller, they've all been coming down on a year over year basis so that those numbers will come down because they've been printing four tenths, five tenths, six tenths every month, and that will help reduce inflation. I said we've got the metric wrong. We should be looking at cumulative gains, not year over year gains. If you look at cumulative gains, the big gains that you see saw in rents and in home prices from two years ago haven't filtered through into the CPI numbers. So while CPI is saying that housing inflation is up 18 to 20%, the real-time measures are saying it's more like 30%. So you're probably going to see stickier housing inflation, not necessarily rising, but stickier, which means we're going to print more five tenths, more four tenths, and that will keep the inflation rate up. So what I'm arguing here is that the inflation rate at 31 Still hasn't taken out its June of 2023 low. It doesn't do it in February. The runway's got some very, very low numbers that we could definitely see us holding 3%. Now, what changes that equation? I like to say, call me if crude oil prices collapse. Call me if the economy takes a serious downturn. Then we could say, okay, now maybe we could see some lower inflation numbers. But if the economy starts looking and crude oil starts looking the same as it has the last three, four, five months into the next three, four, five months, then I think that these inflation numbers are going to be very uncomfortable for the Federal Reserve chairman to be talking about of additional or any rate cut at this point. Let's talk about what comes next then, because there's a huge difference between, okay, we're bottoming at 3.1, we're going to flatline at 3.1 and stay at 3.1 for the next three years, versus we just bottomed at 3.1 and we're about to see a cyclical bounce back to 5%. Uh, Huge difference there. Which way do you see it going? Something in between? A little bit in between. I do see a cyclical bounce back, but maybe not all the way to 5%. And here's why. First of all, let me go back to what I just said to just set the table. Yes, if I wake up one morning and there's red across my quote screens that the markets are falling apart and everybody's worried about a reverse wealth effect or some geopolitical thing happened, okay, I change the forecast. But call me the day that that happens. Uh, no one knows if that's going to happen or not. 
But what I do see is a lot of events out there right now that are suggestive of more inflation rather than less inflation. Housing prices seem to be bottoming. Housing prices seem to be moving higher. What that's telling me is a 7% mortgage. I know that the baseline assumption everybody has is a 7% mortgage is killing everybody. It may be not. I know sales numbers, the volume of homes that turn over is down. And that's not good for the agent, real estate agents. And that's not good for um, mortgage brokers. But home prices, uh, Redfin has a very good metric that I'm, I like to use, and that is the price per square foot. So it adjusts for the size of the home and stuff. That's at a new all-time high. And the old all-time high was May of 22, right when the Fed started cutting our hiking rates, excuse me. So we've just taken that out. Prices are going up. Why? Because people are not stressed. Why are they not stressed? Because 7% mortgage is not stressing. The economy is not forcing them to sell their home. They'll sell it if they get the price they want, which is why we're at all-time highs. And a lot of people aren't willing to pay that, which is why the volumes are down. That's not enough to really impact the economy. It is enough to make a real estate agent's life miserable, but they're not the economy. So real estate is one. Goods is another one. The the Red Sea, I think everybody sees what's happening with the Houthis and the shipping that's going around uh, the Cape of Good Hope and you know, causing delays and, and other kind of bottlenecks with the supply chain. Now, it is not as big a deal as it was in 2021 or 2022, but it is still a deal. And what that is going to do is that is going to lead, I think, to maybe more goods inflation. Oxford Economics has already put a number on it. They said that if this um, Red Sea problem lasts for a year and we're three months into it, and literally the day we're recording might be the first day that a cargo ship is going to sink in the Red Sea, that the Houthis actually hit one with a missile, and it's actually going to sink. Marlon Ruby's its name, and it's it's pretty much halfway down right now. Uh, so it's not not it's been three months, and it's not no, not only not getting better, it's arguably the worst it's been to date. There, that's going to add seven tenths to inflation if it lasts for a year, and I think it can. Now, why? The perception is is that when the the container ships come from Asia to either the United States or to Europe, that they have end consumer goods that go straight to the shelf. There's a, a fair amount of that is what's in there, but a fair amount of that what's in there is other parts and processes that people use in manufacturing in the United States and in Europe. And we live in a just-in-time world. So while the shippers are saying to everybody, calm down, only one ship is about to sink. And by the way, it was carrying fertilizer. It wasn't even carrying uh, finished goods or containers. You'll get your stuff. It might be a week or two late. But in a just-in-time world, a week or two late is a problem. It means that on this day, the, the things that we were going to manufacture, we don't have the parts to. So it's going to snarl our process. And then when we're done with our product, we probably send it to somebody else. It snarls their product, our process. So this will bottleneck up goods as well. So if you look at home prices, you look at goods, those things are starting to maybe start to tick higher. If you look at wages, there is six signs within the payroll report. We've had two consecutive months of 300,000 jobs with the December revision. We had a six-tenths rise of wages in January. Now, that might have been because the work week was reduced. All right, but it's not going to come down to two-tenths. It, you know, it might get revised down. And we've seen in Powell's super core measure where he takes out housing services, energy, and um, food, and you might say, but what's left? What's left is the stuff that's sensitive to wages. That's why he does it. And that's starting to move up. So what I'm trying to say is, sure, I wake up one day and there's red headlines all over the screen. I'll change my forecast. But it, unless we get those red headlines, I see within goods, I see within housing, and I see within wages, things that could start to tick higher, pushing the inflation rate more towards 4%. 
Well, Jim, I agree with you that the Houthi risk is not about to go away from everything I've seen and read. Uh, there's really no way to stop it completely short of a boots in the ground uh, invasion, which uh, you know, I don't think anybody's signing up to do right now. I want to go back to something you said a minute ago that I think is really important, though, which is you said you're going to end up with a situation. You don't need a, a bounce to 5%. If you get a bounce to you know high threes or low fours on inflation... It seems to me that it's really hard for the Fed under those circumstances to justify moving forward with a rate cutting program. Now, I think I asked Mike Green about this last week. Mike seems to think, you know, he said, oh, if you look objectively at the SOFA futures option surface, people are discounting that there is, uh, you know, a possibility of rate hikes instead of cuts this year. Maybe you and Mike Green and really smart people like that can see this, but my read of the room is most of the professional investment community is in a complacent situation where they feel like, look, it's an inflation year. The Fed already announced the cycle of rate cuts is coming this year. There's no way they're going to back out of it. We have to have rate cuts. That seems to me like everybody could get caught on the wrong side of the boat, not seeing what might really be coming. What do you think? No, I, I definitely think that, you know, on the um, the SOFR futures, um, I agree that there is a bit of a t uptick in that, but I've attributed that to people just buying cheap insurance. Oh, we'll buy some just in case we're completely wrong. It doesn't cost a whole lot. And the payoff is really high if we wind up, you know, getting another rate hike. But they're not buying it because they believe that there's a rate hike. They're just buying some some cheap insurance. The reason people think that there's going to be rate cuts is because the Fed keeps talking about rate cuts. You know, that we're going to be cutting rates later this year. Don't worry. We're not going to be cutting them in the March meeting. Probably not going to cut them in the May meeting, but we're going to keep, there's going to be rate cuts. So I think you see that complacency in the stock market and other places. Why, with all of this pushing off of rate cuts, aren't we seeing, we see it in the bond market where yields are up this year and the total return in the bond market is down and it's been struggling. Why don't we see it in the stock market? Because the stock market's attitude is there's going to be rate cuts. I don't want to get bogged down in whether or not it's March or May or June. The Fed has told us there's going to be rate cuts, so just price in rate cuts. And the problem I see is the Fed is political, but and they 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 continually insist that they're not. But let me explain how I think they are political. First of all, I don't think that they're political and that they are going to do a policy that says, well, do we want Biden or do we want Trump? To keep the example simple. So we want one of these guys probably Biden. And so therefore, what is the best policy that we could give to help Biden win? No, they're not this at all. And I agree that they're not that. But what they are is, as we get closer to the election, let's bow out and try and not be part of the narrative at all. If you want an example of that, December 2015, they raised rates for the first time. When was the second rate hike? December 2016, one year later. What happened there in the middle? We had an election. They didn't want to be part of the narrative. Now, so they just bowed out. So what I'm arguing here is if you don't get a rate hike, in, or excuse me, rate cut in March, or you don't get a rate cut in May and June, the probabilities this morning was 57% that you would get a rate cut in June. June is still four months away, 57%. Let's call that a coin toss because that's what that is. If you don't get it in June, then I think the Fed is going to want to not be part of the narrative. And you might not get it until December at the earliest. Why? Because the next meeting is Ju July 18th. When is that? That is the week after the Republican convention and two weeks before the Democrat convention. If the Fed decides to start a rate cutting cycle the week after the Republican convention, as I jokingly like to say, the Republicans will tear Jay Powell's tonsils out for trying, you know, accusing him of trying to rig the system to elect Biden. But if the economy is visibly weakening into July and he cuts rates, then the Democrats will rip his tonsils out for why did you allow this to happen 90 days before the election, Jay? You know, and so. I think what they're going to try and do is at that July meeting, they don't want to be part of the narrative. Now, what I'm differentiating this from is if they had already started cutting once or twice 
And we were talking about a third cut in July. That's far different than starting a rate cut cycle in July. I think if you get to July, they won't start it. September 18th is the meeting after that. They won't start it there. November 7th is the meeting after that. That is the day after the election. Sure, you could do it then, but you could also look intensely political too because you waited till the day after the election. So the calendar works against them. Like I said, that's because they haven't started it. If they started it, if we were talking about the third or fourth or fifth cut, that's not as big a deal as making a policy change literally the week between the Republican and Democrat convention, because then you become part of the narrative. So yes, I agree. They don't sit around going, which way do we want to win and how do we help them win? I don't think they do that at all. They want to not be part of the narrative and not being part of the narrative means don't start in the middle of the campaign season, like in July or September. Okay, so based on everything you've said, it sounds to me, first of all, the the market has already been told by the Fed, don't expect a rate cut in March. Get that out of your head. And the Fed's been pretty clear about that. So nobody's really expecting March. Everything you're saying says to me that the Fed is going to be faced with a very difficult decision that they probably need to make in May. And that decision goes, okay, if we're going to do any rate cuts like we promised we were going to do, we better start now or or else we're going to have to forever hold our cuts. I agree. And I think what the Fed is thinking and what the Fed is hoping for, maybe not hoping, hoping is a strong word, maybe anticipating is a set of weak economic data, and I'm talking about both real growth and I'm talking about inflation, that gives them the cover to move. One of the problems that they've had until now is they don't really have the cover to cut rates. I know Wall Street wants to say, Jay, last mile, Jay, you know, we, we're all thinking that there's going to be a soft landing. Some of us think there's going to be a recession. You know, good enough for government work. Let's start the cutting. And Jay sitting there go, wait a minute, we keep printing 300,000 jobs a month. We keep printing above 3% inflation. We keep printing 200,000 in um, uh, unemployment claims. We keep printing very strong retail sales numbers, except for January. That was weak. But for several months going into January, they were very strong. And Jay's looking around going, we're not getting the data to cut. We're not getting the data to cut yet. So maybe what they're hoping for is by May, we get a weak number. You know, or I'm wrong about uh, what I just said about inflation. And we do print 2.9, 2.87, and it looks like, no, there really is a last mile on its way to two. That's what they're looking or anticipating. But then the real problem comes, what if you start getting to April or May and the data kind of looks like it's looked the last 90 days over the next 90 days, then they're kind of out of runway. And then the answer is, well, we could revisit this in December or if the data gets bad. And then Wall Street, which at one point in January was pricing in seven rate cuts for the entire year, might be looking at one or none for the end of the year. Now, would that be a big shock? No, it wouldn't be a big shock because Wall Street gets these forecasts wrong a lot. And I'll remind everybody in 2022, first of all, I'll remind everybody that a rate hike or rate cut is defined as 25 basis points. So in 20 in January of 2022, we started the year with everybody thinking there'd be two or three or four rate hikes. And then at the end of January, Jamie Dimon came out, the chairman of JP Morgan, and said, you know what? I think we're going to see six or seven rate hikes. Six or seven? No, there can't be that many, Jamie. Well, he was wrong too. And so was Wall Street. We got 22 rate hikes in 2022. That'd be four and a quarter percent is what we wound up getting. So they were they started the year thinking we were going to get three or four. Jamie thought he was being smart by saying six, and we wound up with 22. So yes, they get these f- kind of forecasts completely wrong all the time. So how big of a shock would it be that at one point we priced in seven rate cuts and we might wind up with zero or one? Not much at all if you look at the history of this stuff. I want to go back to something you said a few minutes ago about complacency in the stock market. And I agree with you. There's so many indications of divergent breadth and and lots of reasons to question why the heck are we up here at at well over 5,000 on the S&P. I think a lot of it has to do with this expectation that everybody thinks that Uh, some kind of cutting cycle this year before the election is a done deal. It's going to happen no matter what. I think you and I now agree they're probably wrong about being so certain about that. But at the same time, 
as long as they think that, the market stays complacent. So when does the aha moment happen when the stock market says, oh, shit, we got a problem here? Oh, it could be as early as, um, you know, mid-March. You know, March 8th, we get payrolls. March 12th, we get CPI. February payrolls, February, February CPI. Because the January numbers was what really took the market from seven rate cuts to three rate cuts. That's what we got priced in now is uh, three rate cuts for the rest of the year. So it, those two numbers took four rate cuts out of the market. So that could be one. If those numbers are strong, or you know, if they're weak, that changes the equation as well too. But I think that over the next 90 to 120 days, if we don't see that data really giving the Fed the opening that they need, like I said, July, could you have a rate cut? Sure. If it's not the first one, especially if it's the third one, you could definitely have one in July or September. But I don't think the Fed could really want to start there because they'll be swallowed up as part of the narrative, you know, and one side or the other will accuse them of trying to rig the economy to get the, their favorite candidate elected, even though I don't believe that that's what they're doing. Now, why is it that rates matter so much? Because a lot of people say to me, oh, it's about AI and it's about strong earnings. And that's what's really driving the stock market and stuff. Yeah, that well, that that does help. And that definitely has caused the MAG7 stocks to separate from the other 493 stocks in the S&P. But uh, uh, you know, long-term studies of the stock market say, given the current level of valuation, given roughly the current level of interest rates, what is it that you can reasonably expect the stock market, the whole stock market, MAG7 and everything, can you expect it to do over the next three, five, seven years? About an 8% per annum return. goes up 8% a year. It's a little bit above that right now, but there can always be a correction along the way. And it doesn't mean you have to have 8% every single year. You just average out about 8% uh, per annum. You went down big in 22, up big in 23, you know, and that actually averaged out to about zero. Well, if interest rates, and let's keep the example simple, money market funds at 5.3%, that's like 70% of what you're going to get out of the stock market. That's what's bothering the stock market. There's money pouring in. And I was just right before we started talking, was looking at the latest numbers on money market flows. And they're still pouring money into money markets. And I know that there's people on Wall Street screaming, there is no alternative. You got to get out of these money market funds. And the argument you'll hear from people is, well, that was 2019's argument when these money funds were yielding 10 basis points. But now that they're yielding 530 basis points, and that's like 70% of what I can get in the stock market, thank you very much. I'll take a $1 NAV every single day and take 70% of the stock market's gains. So Wall Street would love the Fed to get the competition out, cut these rates so they could start screaming Tina louder to everybody to say you've got to get into risk assets because that's the only place that you're going to get a return. And as that reality comes in, that that competition is going to stick around for a while and all that money that's in money funds, you know, the, uh, the, the cash on the sidelines argument that you hear, which by the way, I've been in the markets for over 35 years. In my first day in the markets, people told me about cash on the sidelines and they're still telling me about cash on the sidelines. You know, that argument might go to, yeah, there's a lot of money on the sidelines in money market funds and it's going to stay there because that 5.3% yield isn't going away. And they're very happy with that. Okay. So the first big conclusion is if the Fed's going to cut at all this year, they need to start in either May or June. And nobody thinks March is going to happen unless there's a big data surprise between now and then. Let's come back to that March 12th CPI uh, data release that's coming up in just a couple of weeks. Um, what happens if we get a second hot CPI print in a row, meaning meaning something above expectations? Does that panic the market as, oh my gosh, something's different than we thought? Or is it kind of shrug it off? Because it seems like last time the market started to panic on that hot CPI print. It only lasted a day and they're like, ah, nah, it's just, you know, one, one print's not a trend. Right. Now, I, I will say, though, if I was to split the baby here, the stock market freaked out for a day and then recovered. The bond market sold off hard on that big hot CPI number and never really recovered. It's still at essentially the same levels. It's been trending sideways after the sell-off since that big hot CPI number. And let's remember that that was a four-tenths number, uh, three-tenths core. Now, going into the March number, I suspect that the consensus, because 
Gasoline prices nationwide are up about 4.5% versus January into February. And they're about 3.2% of CPI. So if you multiply 4% by 3.2%, you wind up getting like 0.15. So almost one between one tenth and two tenths of that inflation rate is gasoline alone. In January, that was zero. So it's it's definitely putting a positive wind into the number. So I suspect Wall Street's gonna be looking for a four tenths number and probably close to a three tenths number on uh, core. And if we get those numbers, uh, you know, we might breathe a sigh of relief and go, oh, well, at least they were consensus. You go, but wait a minute, these were kind of big consensus numbers, and they're not really helping the narrative to get that last mile going so we could beat on Jay to cut rates in May or June. But if we get a beat at, with those level of numbers, that would be very worrisome, I think, for Wall Street at this point. And what we've been seeing with the numbers lately is a lot of uh, beats. In, I'm talking about over the last two or three months between PPI, CPI, and PCE, we've been seeing consistent beats. So even if we don't, even just keep in mind that what Wall Street should be expecting on that May 12th number is a fairly hot number because of the rise in gasoline prices. Okay, so it seems pretty clear that economic data generally is going to be particularly important this spring and into the summertime. So let's talk more about that. And specifically, I want to expand this because what people often forget is, you know, especially as you're looking at something like the, the U.S. dollar index, you've got to look at the economic data, not just in isolation at U.S. data, but how does it compare with what's going on in the rest of the world? How does the U.S. look? Because that's really what determines where the dollar goes and, of course, where the dollar goes it dictates a lot of where asset prices go. So what does the economic data globally look like? How does that you know, relate to what we see in the US and what does it mean for the dollar? So let me go back to my what I said at the top. Coming out of 2020, things changed. Uh, change does not mean worse. One of the things that we've seen is the savings rate in the United States was it, from 2010 to 2020, it averaged 6%. Now it's averaging 4% since the beginning of 22. That's where I got that number that I said that we used to spend 94% of every dollar we made, and now we're spending 96% of every dollar we made. And not surprisingly, from 2010 to 2020, personal consumption as a percent of GDP was 67%, and now it's 69%, 2% points higher. And this, all these numbers are after inflation. So this is not just that, you know, inflation, this is we're buying more units of things. We're buying more stuff. We're buying more services. Uh, We are spending more money coming out of 2020. Maybe it was PTSD or something else. Maybe it was a belief that, you know, if things go bad, the government's going to mail me money because they did the last time. So I want to enjoy my life. I want to buy things. I want to revenge travel, doom spend, whatever we want to call it but we're spending more money and the economy is staying much hotter than what we've seen before. And that's why as you look at the global economy, you see a very interesting pattern developing. We're spending more money. The rest of the world is not. They're spending the same levels that they did pre-pandemic. Now we've got more remote work. We mail checks and that's really We're not nearly as socialist as a lot of the European countries, and that was really different for us to do than maybe for them to do. I'm just throwing out ideas as to why we're spending more money. There's no definitive answer. But the, the reality is that our economy is moving along much hotter. So Q3, the GDP of the United States is 4.9%. That's really hot. That is a big number for it to be 4.9%. Q4, it was 3.3. That's above average. So we just had two very, very strong quarters in Q3 and Q4. Japan, Canada, Germany, the UK, and the Eurozone larger, because Germany's in there, they all had at least one contracting, one negative GDP quarter in either Q3 or Q4. In the case of the UK and Japan, both Q3 and Q4 were contracting. You could argue that the UK and Japan are in technical recessions. What happened to global synchronized growth? We're booming. UK's in recession. We're booming. Japan's in recession. We're booming. Germany's throwing up a negative 
GDP number. Canada's throwing up a negative GDP number. The Eurozone threw up a negative GDP number. So the economies are definitely out of sync and we're growing much faster. That's why I think that we could very well see a situation where we don't cut rates, but they do. And that differential in growth and that differential in interest rates should keep the dollar stronger. One last thought for you. I said earlier, 40% of Wall Street is still predicting a recession over the next uh, year. Historically, any random year, Wall Street would give you about a 15 or 20% chance of recession. But now they're 40. They're down from 65, like in the fall, last fall. Uh, and there's still talk about a potential of a recession or a soft landing. I think what Wall Street's done is they've put all the inputs into their model. And what they're spitting out is what's happening in the rest of the world, the developed world I'm talking about. They're getting the negative numbers. They're getting the contractions. What they haven't put into their model is, but add 2% more spending for the United States than everywhere else. And that might help to explain why we're growing so much stronger and they're not. And we have yet to really embrace that idea that coming out of the, out of the pandemic, like, like I said, every financial crisis, every recession, the economy changes a little bit. It changed on this one. So we're spending more. How long will that last? Until the next recession. And then whatever the re psyche is, how the psyche is affected on that one, we'll change it coming out of that one too. But right now, we spend more. Like I said, you know, we, we know the words, doom spending, you know, revenge travel. So we know that we're doing it. We're just assuming that it either A, was temporary, it was a one-time spend and we're done, or B, we're thinking that it's, oh, it's this excess savings, that we had this big run-up in GM2 and everything, and now that we're running down the excess savings, that they'll stop. Well, excess savings is hard to measure, and you could argue that we've already run it down, or you could argue we haven't run it down. But even on an after-inflation basis, we're just buying more things than we did before. And you know, maybe I'm wrong on the rationale. But the data is pretty clear that the spending is definitely stronger. And that's why it's showing up in the Fed not getting the numbers to cut. And they're not changing their spending in the rest of the world. And they are getting some very low and contracting kind of GDP numbers. Jim, tell me your outlook for the dollar index. We're just barely below 104, which is a key technical level. It was trending down for a couple of weeks, but today, Wednesday, the day before our listeners hear this, looks like it's starting to maybe tick back up again. I think we're at an important level on the dollar index, and I could see it breaking out, and I could see it going higher. You know, 105, 106, I'm not you know in a, in a massive camp. But again, if we're stronger and we have higher interest rates and they're weaker with lower interest rates... That differential should produce a stronger dollar uh, r relative to all the other fiat currencies as we go forward. And that has largely been the case over the last couple of months that the dollar has been either sideways to slightly higher, and I think it will continue to be. Let's touch on gold because a lot of people... Uh, they they heard the Fed say, okay, we're going to cut rates. So many people were eyeing this gold chart saying, boy, if we got a breakout above 2100, that, that completes a cup and handle pattern. It's, you know, all the gold bugs are excited because it targets 2700 plus as far as where the, the next upside move might go. Everybody got excited about that dot plot release and levered up their gold position saying, okay, the fix is in. It, it's got to happen this year. This is the year that it's all going to happen. Seems to me, based on everything you're saying, that's nothing close to a sure bet. So what could this mean for precious metals? Yeah, well, you know, precious metals definitely benefit when there's stress in the financial system. Stress can come in many forms. It could come in the form of, of too high inflation or financial crisis, geopolitical problems, political problems, whatever puts stress in the system. If what I said is correct in that you're not going to see stress in the U.S. to the extent that the economy stays strong, but inflation stays elevated and the Fed can't cut. Well, that's not necessarily stress. I mean, it might be stressful for, like I said, real estate agents, and it might be stressful for stockbrokers that want everybody to get their money out of money market funds. But beyond that, that's not really going to produce a whole lot of stress. Now, that stress may continue to show up in the rest of the world 
like I said, they're already printing negative GDPs in the UK and in Japan and in some other countries. I don't think you're going to see that stress level to really push gold to the next level. Sure, it could still hover around the low 2000s range where it's been lately, but are we getting ready to go to a 22, 23, 2400 on gold? Like I said, call me when we got the, the, the blood red all over the screens and bad things have happened. And like I said, I can't predict that any more than anybody else can. I can only react to that. So that's what you're back to hope, but hope is not a strategy. You know, hope that something bad happens and that will push up gold. And if it doesn't, gold is, I don't think, predetermined to head higher. But what I didn't say was necessarily uh, that it would sell off. I think it will just kind of stay in this range right here. And actually what I'm arguing is probably the most frustrating of all calls. Go up. Okay, I could do something with it. Go down. I could do something. I could sell it. I could add to my position. Go sideways. And that's probably the most frustrating of all the calls. Jim, I can't thank you enough for another terrific interview, as always. Before I let you go, though, please tell us, particularly for our institutional audience, more about what you do at Bianco Research. You're one of the top macro fixed income guys in the entire industry. What are your research products about? What's on offer at BiancoResearch.com? So two things. BiancoResearch.com is my business that I've had for 26 years. It is a macro business. It is an institutional service and that kind of hints at the price. But if you're more of a retail customer and don't want to pay for institutional service, I am very active on Twitter uh, on a whole range of topics as well, talking about the topics we discussed and a lot of other topics. Along the way too, we have an ETF. It is Our partner on that is Wisdom Tree. I manage a thing called the Bianco Research Fixed Income Index. It's a discretionally managed index. And Wisdom Tree has an ETF, WTBN, Wisdom Tree Bianco, Nancy, WTBN, that tracks my index. It is a fully invested fixed income index. The largest sum of money in the world is fully invested fixed income money. We're trying to position ourselves based on some of the views you've heard me discuss here to outperform. We are outperforming this year. Uh, I would say we're also down on the year because the bond market is down a lot on the year. We're just down less. But I do think that ultimately the bond market will rebound and it will go up higher. BiancoAdvisors.com is where you can find out more about the ETF, about the index and the ETF. So Bianco Research is our research business. Bianco Advisors is our ETF business. And you can follow me on Twitter at, at Bianco Research or on LinkedIn at Jim Bianco or Bianco Research on YouTube. And again, folks, the ticker for the ETF is Whiskey Tango Bravo November. WTBN. Patrick Serezna, Nick Galarnik, and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Eric, it was great to have Jim back on the show. Now, joining us again in the post-game segment is Nick Galarnik. Now, let's get to that chart deck. Listeners, you're going to find the download link for the post-game chart deck in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, that means you have not yet registered at MacroVoices.com. Just go to our homepage, MacroVoices.com, and click on the red button over Jim's picture saying, looking for the downloads. Eric, let's start off with just uh, covering crude oil, starting with the EIA inventory. EIA reported a build of 4.2 million barrels on crude oil, Cushing, Oklahoma, building another 1.5 million barrels. Gasoline drawing down 2.8 million barrels. Distillates drawing down 510,000 barrels for a net petroleum build of 0.9 million barrels. U.S. production holding steady at 13.3 million barrels. The flat price and the time spreads are seriously out of whack. I've never seen a disparity between flat price and time spreads last this long. It seems to suggest that the financial markets are being suppressed by financial actors who are bearish for whatever set of macro reasons, while physical markets are getting tighter and tighter on supply. Normally, that's super bullish for the flat price. You see the spreads widening into deeper backwardation. It's usually a pretty reliable 
reliable signal that the flat price will follow and move higher. But that usually happens within a day or two. So far, there's been no reaction on the tape. So I'm not sure what to make of this, but I do know for certain that the physical market is getting tighter. Time spreads don't lie. Why it is that the flat price isn't following? Well, that's anyone's guess. We'll see what happens, but I'm guessing this is more likely to resolve to the upside on flat price than it is to resolve to the downside in the time spreads. Eric, I get your point that so far there's no reaction on the tape, at least if you're looking for that break to new multi-month highs. But when we step back and look at it, we are trading at the multi-month highs and every dip has been bought and we are now going on several weeks of sustained price action above the 50-day moving average. And so we're uh, at a level where even though crude oil hasn't broken out, it's still in very good shape and has all the potential for a breakout. If we did have that breakout uh, to 80 plus, uh, the the first logical target would be in the mid 80s, around $85 where the fib retracement zones lie. And so let's see whether the bulls can pull this off. Now, Eric, let's move on to equities. Uh, What are your thoughts here? Well, Louis Vincent Gav's comment that this feels like 1999 all over again really rings true for me. To be sure, the breadth divergences and other signs that we're seeing say that this market is top-heavy and overdue for a sharp downside reversal. But look, as far as I'm concerned, we were right back when we said those exact same things here on Macro Voices, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 500 S&P points lower. But the market just kept melting up anyway. The big catalyst for the rally to new all-time highs seems to have been the Fed's dovish pivot. So if Jim's call from the feature interview proves right, it should mean look out below for the stock market once everybody figures out that maybe all of those cuts aren't so certain to happen after all. But we've been proven wrong on so many bearish calls that I've lost count. And when you get to the mania phase of a bull market cycle, anything is possible to the upside. So I have no idea how much upside is left before gravity sets in, but I'm definitely going to be paying attention at 8.30 a.m. on March 12th when the CPI data hits the tape. All right. I want to get Nick involved in the conversation. Nick, both the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq have been doing relatively well. I want to just know what levels you're watching on both of them. So on S&P right now, the spot price on SPX is 50.70 approximately. There's a call wall above at 5100 and a put wall below at 4500. The implied move for the March 15th monthly OPEX is plus minus 100 points. Therefore, the upper implied move is 5170 and the lower implied move is 4970. Right now, key resistance sits at 5100, key support at 5000. On the queues, we have a spot price of approximately 435. We have a call wall above at 440 and a put wall below at 410, previous all-time highs. The implied move for the March 15th monthly OPEX is plus minus 12 points. Therefore, the upper implied move is 447, and the lower implied move is 423. Right now, key resistance sits at 440, the call wall, and key support sits at 410, the previous all-time highs. All right, Nick, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into just sizing up this market. Obviously, for numerous weeks, we've been talking about that at some point there's going to be a correction and that the market's overextended on the upside. I wanted to just put a little more context into that and perspective. So uh, on page five, uh, I have the S&P 500, and it's just showing how the fact that in 120 days, we uh, have now advanced 1,000 S&P points or 25%. And when we just compare that to like, for instance, the previous bull advance that we had coming off the October lows, uh, we had a, a rally that was about 20% and it lasted about 136 days. And so this is a a rally that's now still shorter than the last one, but it's uh, certainly had more velocity on the upside. But inevitably, a market correction starts. And so right now, clearly, uh, as we've just uh, seen the print on the PCE price index, uh, this is not the catalyst for uh, beginning some sort of a correction or pullback. The bulls remain decisively in charge of this trend. Every dip has been bought. And we're still holding decisively above 5,000, which I think is an incredibly important level for the bulls to maintain in order for the uptrend to be able to continue. Uh, But we have a scenario where 
inevitably, once given a trigger, all of the stock renters on the upside uh, will be involved in providing all of the selling that will inevitably drive the correction. And so I want, on page six, what I wanted to touch on was uh, where that selling will inevitably come from. And so uh, here I have the CTA positioning uh, number from Goldman Sachs, as well as the, the amount of leverage in the markets. And on a one-year basis, we're at the 99th percentile of leverage. The CTA positioning is at five-year high highs and all the vol targeting funds are, are basically very well leveraged up because the vol has been suppressed for uh, down to such low levels. Inevitably, these people are not buy and hold investors. These are uh, uh, trend followers. And as soon as uh, there's any shift, what they were providing all the buying on the way up, and they will also be providing all of the selling on the way down when they deleverage. And uh, the big question is, is how long can the bulls make this last and how far will it go? Yeah, Patrick, I totally agree. You know, right now, I think we're pretty overextended with this PCE print this morning, again, with another little pop up to the upside. What I'm looking at on the long side for myself personally is long Russell small caps. So I've been saying that for the past few months and unfortunately I've been kind of wrong, but now I think I'm actually going to be right because we're seeing the Russell, that being IWM, handily outperform the S&P and the NASDAQ right now. So if we do push higher, I think we need to see, you know, more breadth increase and that means small caps push the upside. Um, and also, we might see some short covering, perhaps, and some names that are you know lower in quality overall, which would also push the Russell higher as well. Um, otherwise, you know, for the Nasdaq, I'm not very excited about anything right now. You know, looking at Apple right now, for example, they just slashed their EV endeavor and they reassigned a lot of their staff to AI. Right, so a lot of companies are focusing on AI right now, which makes a lot of sense. It's it's all the hype, but perhaps this hype is not warranted because will it drive revenues going forward? Perhaps, but I think we're going to see more so efficiencies in operations by cutting staff, for example, and replacing those staff with AI, which can make current employees more efficient. All right, Nick, though, I wanted to just touch on two more charts, uh, and I wanted to just highlight uh, the parabolic nature of the two hottest securities, Bitcoin and NVIDIA. And uh, what I wanted to simply point out is that we have now entered the parabolic phases of these advances, which is the stage where they just accelerate from pure buying momentum and the FOMO of chasing these things higher because this is the only place where performance is. The thing is, is that what makes me more suspect that we could be approaching a high from a timing perspective is that even though I wouldn't want to predict where the exact high of Bitcoin will come or where whether NVIDIA will or will not hit 900 in the next couple of weeks. But when you're entering these parabolic phases, they usually doesn't take very much time for those upper targets to be achieved and some sort of a, a swing high to be formed. And so watching these types of securities that were in these little mini bubbles is um, really important to me because uh, we want to see when finally the bulls uh, exhaust all of the fuel and there's no marginal buyers and some sort of profit taking cycle begins because it probably will be uh, correspond with uh, where the short term highs in the market will come. Yeah, Patrick, you know, my thinking here, and again, I'm not a big proponent of Bitcoin, like I do own some clean spark, for example, and I own a little bit of Bitcoin myself, but I'm not a big proponent of it, is that everyone knows the halving is coming, which is why we're seeing this massive run. So if everyone's front running this event, in all probability, we might see a sell off after the event itself. All right, Nick, let's move on to the volatility index on page nine. Now, we are a little bit higher off of the uh, Janu December, January lows, but uh, we still don't have any meaningful rises in volatility yet. That nervousness simply has not uh, materialized yet. What levels are you watching on the VIX here? On the VIX right now, with the current level of approximately 14, this would denote intraday moves of top to bottom of about 0.75% roughly. Right now, looking at the high level of around 16-ish, that's where I would look for a possible breakout toward 20. But again, we need some kind of exogenous risk event for that to occur because right now what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of selling of both put options on downside moves and call options out of the money on upside moves. So we're seeing kind of, you know, markets up, vol up. But then what's happening is that we're, we're seeing um, participants take advantage of that by selling out of the money calls 
on that move up in the same way that participants sell puts on the move down as well. So a lot of this selling is suppressing the intraday moves, keeping us in tighter ranges than usual. And we're seeing these uh, intraday moves of about you know 0.62% top to bottom, which is actually lower than the intraday move den- denoted by the VIX itself. Now moving on to page 10, we have the US dollar index. Eric, what are your thoughts here? 104 is a critical technical level, and we're teetering right on top of it. To my eye, the technicals are ambiguous. I could make a technical argument in either direction. If Jim Bianco is right on inflation, a higher dollar is probably in the cards, and if it goes a lot higher, that could break a lot of things. But I think it's too early to call this market either way. Well, Eric, I'm just keeping it super simple. Uh, As you can see on page 10, I just put that 50-day moving average and the dollar index basically once breaking above that 50-day back in January has uh, been more or less consolidating along it. While the slope hasn't risen much and we haven't seen the breakout, at this stage, I I think that uh, the dollar is still in half decent shape for a potential bull breakout. So let's see whether the bulls can make that punch above the 104.50 level and actually hold it this time. Now, next we have the gold futures chart on page 11. What are you guys thinking here? I took the topping pattern in the slow stochastics as an opportunity to cut my exposure to long gold futures in half over the past week, getting out of half of my position in the mid-2040s. I'm still super duper bullish on gold long term. But if Jim's proven right, and I think the odds of that are better than 50-50, I think we probably have a test of 1922 or lower coming. And if that happens, I want to have plenty of dry powder to buy it in size. Uh, Eric, gold has been consolidating now for uh, uh, two plus months, and we have seen uh, this consolidation come and test the 2000 level. Now you can just connect a a trend line along all the highs, which happens to correspond with that 50-day moving average that I kept on there as well. And more or less, it lines up in this 2050 area. And to me, it's super simple. We're gonna use this as a pivot level. Uh, If uh, the gold trade stays at 2050 or less and then breaks back down, then the correction isn't over. But uh, I'm looking for any sustained period above 2050, because that would start repairing the chart and making the price action look more constructive, which may start attracting buyers. Uh, Let's see whether or not the gold bulls show up. Eric, it's been quite a correction on this uranium dip. What are your thoughts here? I think the correction we've seen in uranium and uranium miners is ending, with the caveat that month-end effects could easily lead to one last push lower on Thursday, the day this podcast will be released. Our good friend Justin Hewn over at UraniumInsider.com put out an excellent subscribers-only video on Sunday laying out his hypothesis for exactly what caused this sell-off and when and why he expects it to end. Out of respect for Justin's other paying subscribers, obviously I can't can't share those details on the podcast. But suffice it to say, Justin isn't telling his subscribers to sell anything here. So I think uranium and uranium miners are a strong buy here. But my one big caveat is that just like junior gold miners used to be, uranium mining shares have a very high retail participation and relatively low institutional participation. Uh, Look, there's no nice way to say this, but retail investors are famous for rushing in at the tops for fear of missing out and then panic selling at the bottoms out of uh, fear of losses. So if Jim's inflation call proves right and the broader stock market enters a deep correction, I think it could bring an even deeper correction in uranium mining shares, purely because of that retail panic factor. For that reason, I think the metal is safer than the miners here, and if we get another hot inflation print, I'll definitely be putting my S&P hedges back on. The short, medium, and long-term fundamentals for uranium couldn't possibly be better, but investor sentiment trumps fundamentals, and like I said, uranium miners are volatile issues because of their heavy retail participation. Eric, it does make sense uh, for this to uh, be a buy on dip. The fundamental story that's been driving uranium hasn't really changed. And so inevitably, uh, like what will happen with the stock markets, uranium uh, just went through a profit taking cycle. These things happen in these market cycles. And uh, it's very reasonable to assume that this will present that buying opportunity. Folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. The details are on the last pages of the slide deck, or just go to bigpicturetrading.com. 
Patrick, tell them what they can expect to find in this week's Research Roundup. In this week's Research Roundup, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, the chart book that we just discussed here in the postgame, and a number of links to articles that we found really interesting. So you're going to find this and so much more in this week's Research Roundup. Well, that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make this program even better. For those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend, that is Eric spelled with a K, and follow Patrick at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend, Patrick Serezna, and myself, thanks for listening and see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.